Hi, it's Mr. Evans. Welcome to Room 310 Biology and our fourth HSA review. This video is going to predominantly feature inheritance of traits, how traits are passed on from one generation to the next. So let's get started with asexual reproduction. If I put the letter A in front of a word, it means not. So this is not sexual reproduction. In other words, there's no sperm cell, there's no egg cell, there's no fertilization, there's no zygotes. It's asexual reproduction. So the organism shown in this picture is a hydra, something like a small freshwater jellyfish. And the adult hydra has actually grown an offspring right out of its side. Now there was no sperm cell, egg cell, no fertilization involved. It simply is growing another organism right out of its side. Eventually this is going to pinch off and this new hydra will be a free living organism, but it has the exact same genetic information as its parent, so essentially it's a clone. This process is known as budding. Uh, budding occurs in several organisms. It also occurs in yeast, which are a type of protist. They simply grow a new organism right from their bodies. Another important type of asexual reproduction occurs in bacteria, and this is binary fission. Binary means to, fission means to split. So I've got a prokaryotic cell, I have a bacterium, it does not have a nucleus, but in its center, it does have a single chromosome that's a little loop of DNA. So the first thing the bacterium will need to do when it wants to reproduce is to replicate its DNA. So now it has two identical copies. The cell is going to begin to elongate, stretch out, and pinch in the center. And then the cell will simply pinch in half. The bacteria are identical to this cell. There are just now two more cells, and except for an occasional mutation, they're always going to be exactly alike. There won't be any genetic diversity. But binary fission is fast. It can occur in 20 minutes or so, and it's very, very efficient. Prokaryotes, the bacteria, the most numerous organisms on the planet. Vegetative propagation is a third means of asexual reproduction. We have a plant here that has sent out a specialized shoot called a runner, where the runner hits, it grows down into the soil, new plant grows up, and another runner can come out, and another runner can come out. All of the plants are going to be genetically identical from the original source. They are basically clones of one another. Well, if we move to sexual reproduction, the key term to know here is meiosis. Meiosis makes gametes. Gametes are reproductive cells. They include sperm cells and they include egg cells. In meiosis, I'm looking at a diploid cell. It's got two sets of chromosomes. After a series of divisions, it's going to produce four haploid cells. And these are haploid. They have half the number of chromosomes as the original um, cell did that gave rise to them. Why is this really going on? Well, if we looked at an egg cell and a sperm cell, if we're thinking humans, this has 23 chromosomes, the sperm cell does. It's delivering them to an egg with 23. Upon fertilization, you'll have a zygote that is back to the normal diploid number of 46. The zygote then undergoes mitosis many, many, many times and produces a full organism. If we didn't have meiosis and this reduction in chromosome number, we'd have huge problems. 46 is the normal diploid number. Without meiosis, the offspring would have 92 chromosomes. That child grows up, becomes an adult, produces offspring with someone else with 92 chromosomes, you'd be up to 184. So in just a few generations, we'd have thousands of chromosomes, and it just simply wouldn't work. But fortunately, we have meiosis. Now, the other interesting thing about meiosis, besides having the number of chromosomes, occurs early on when the chromosomes have replicated. Notice that the chromosomes have mixed up colors in this compared to the parent cell. This is because of crossing over. In crossing over, whole pieces of DNA between homologous chromosomes get swapped. 
So when you swap the DNA, you are creating gametes that have brand new combinations of genes that are different from the parent cell from which they came. This is really important because meiosis creates variation. In sex and meiosis, all this crossing over creates variety. For variation is what drives evolution. If there's no differences among all the organisms, you're not going to have any evolution occurring. There's no advantage because nobody is any different than anyone else. I don't want to spend a lot of time on Punnett squares. I'll remind you of the key terms. Homozygous, so if both alleles for a trait are the same, this is homozygous dominant, this is homozygous recessive. Both alleles for a particular trait are the same. Uh, we also have heterozygous, and in heterozygous, the alleles for a trait are going to be different. And remember, if we're looking at letters that represent traits, we're looking at genotypes. Um, genotypes are the letters we use to represent traits. Phenotypes are the physical appearance, something we can see or measure. Um, I can see red hair. I can see um, tall. I can see freckles. These are phenotypes, things I can see or measure. Now, you might ask me to uh, do a Punnett square, for instance, where you cross a heterozygote with a homozygous recessive. Well, you'll be given scrap paper and a pencil, so go ahead and work your problems out on the side before you enter your answer. And you might see in this case we will get a heterozygote, we'll get a homozygous recessive, we'll get a heterozygote, we'll get a homozygous recessive. In other words, we get a one-to-one -one ratio of um, phenotypes, uh, this has the dominant phenotype. This has the recessive phenotype. We have a one-to-one -one ratio of genotypes. A heterozygote, there's one um, heterozygote for every homozygous recessive. Another type of problem you might be asked to do is to work backwards. Uh, I'm going to use the example of being able to taste the chemical PTC. Um, you can buy test papers that are coated with this chemical. Um, the chemical apparently tastes very bitter and nasty, um, but I happen to be a non-taster. I cannot taste this chemical. It's a genetic trait, so I must be recessive because this is a dominant trait. If you have one capital T, you'll be able to taste the chemical. I can't, so I am homozygous recessive. Well, my wife, I gave her a strip of this paper once, and it turned out she could taste it. So I know that she has one dominant allele, but I don't know what her other one is. Is she homozygous dominant, capital T, capital T, or is she heterozygous? Well, to find out, my children all tasted this chemical too. It's perfectly harmless. My daughter Grace turned out to be a taster. She can taste the chemical. My daughter Sarah turned out to be able to taste the chemical, so she must have at least one dominant allele. My son Joe, however, just like me, he is homozygous recessive. He is unable to taste the chemical. So to find out what my wife's genotype is, I could set up a Punnett square, and I can, through the process of meiosis, I can put my alleles across the top, and I know she has one dominant allele because my wife can taste the chemical. We certainly had a daughter who could. We had a second daughter who could. But my son can't taste it. He's lowercase t, lowercase t. Therefore, my wife must be heterozygous. And had we had a fourth child, maybe we had a 50-50 chance of having either a taster or a non-taster. We simply had to work backwards to get our correct answer. Sex determination, remember the 23rd pair of chromosomes determines the sex of an organism. XX is what produces females, and if there's an XY chromosome, well, then we're going to have a male. Briefly want to touch on pedigrees. 
Um, squares represent males, circles represent females. Um, in generation one, we have an affected male, it's shaded in, skips a generation. Of, um, generation three, we have an affected female. What's the mode of inheritance? Is it dominant? Is it recessive? Or is it sex linked? Well, my tip off is right here in this generation. Neither parent has the trait. So I'm going to tell you that this is recessive inheritance and that these parents are heterozygous and that this child right here, this female, had a 25% chance of inheriting both recessive alleles. There's a few diseases that have this mode of transmission, notably um, cystic fibrosis is a recessive disorder. Um, this next pedigree looks a little bit different. Uh, we have an affected male in the first generation, had two children, a female and a male, and this male right here had a child with it as well. If it doesn't skip generations, a parent has it in every generation, it's most likely a dominant form of inheritance. And finally, we have sex-linked inheritance. Um, you may see circles that are half shaded in. These are indicating a carrier female. And the female is carrying this trait on her X chromosome. So a female is XX. I'm going to use the genetic disease hemophilia for an example. A carrier female has a good gene on one chromosome and a copy of the recessive on the other. She doesn't show any symptoms of the disease because she's got the good gene on one X chromosome to cover up the recessive on her other. A male who has the disorder is going to be X lowercase h Y. He will have the disorder because he has no allele on the Y chromosome to cover up this recessive allele. So hemophilia is a good example and I'm going to go ahead and do a cross between a carrier female and a normal male. A normal male in this situation will have the good gene, the capital H on his X chromosome and no gene for hemophilia on his Y. So I'll end up with a completely normal female. She can't even pass the trait on. I'll end up with a normal male. Hemophilia is a disease of blood clotting. This male will be able to clot blood normally. I will have a carrier female once again, but this male right here inherits the bad allele from his mom and no allele for the trait from his dad. So this male right here will be affected. Um, color blindness, the most common form of color blindness, is also a sex-linked trait. So someone with that um, trait wouldn't be able to see necessarily the red ink that I'm writing in today. Um, I'll leave you with one problem from a released HSA exam. I'd like you to read it and then maybe stop the video and then check to see whether you're correct. Um, a parent who is homozygous for brown hair is being crossed with someone who is heterozygous for brown hair. So when I set up my Punnett square, I always work these out off to the side. What's the probability that the offspring will have brown hair? Here's one with brown hair. Here's one with brown hair. Here's one with brown hair despite the fact that they're heterozygous. And here is another with brown hair. So 100% probability. This is the information I have on reproduction and inheritance of traits. Uh, make sure you study and make sure what you're confused about, you go into class and you ask questions.